Hello, we want to think about consumer surplus and producer surplus and market efficiency. But before we can do that, we need to understand demand and supply a bit better. Here's an example. This is on a demand curve, and the demand curve shows how much consumers are willing to pay for a particular good. Now, what determines how much a person is willing to pay for something? Well, how much value the person gets from that good. But what determines how much value you get for something? Well, how much benefit you get from that last good. This is why willingness to pay and the marginal benefit are much related to each other. In fact, they are the same thing, and they are both equal to the demand curve. So the demand curve shows how much benefit you get from the last good that you consume, and therefore how much you'll be willing to pay for that good. Now here's an example. According to this diagram, it shows that a consumer would be willing to pay $40 for the last or the tenth pair of, say, jeans. Now what determines how much you're actually willing to pay for something? Can that change? Well, yeah. Your willingness to pay will change, for example, if your income changes. If you have more income, you'll be willing to pay more for a particular good. It will also change if the price of other pants were to change. For example, if pants become more, other pants become more expensive, a substitute, then you'd be willing to pay more for this pair of jeans. Of course, you're also willing to pay more for something if you like it more. And you might even be willing to pay more for something if you think it's going to be ex more expensive in the future, so you have expectations. All these things will affect your willingness to pay. But again, they will all show up in your demand curve. If income increases, prices of other pants increases, you like something more, and you think it's going to become more expensive in the future, what would happen is that your demand curve would be shifting outwards. Okay, so that's demand. Let's think about supply a little bit. Supply is very similar, but now we're thinking about a firm instead of a consumer. The supply curve shows how much a firm would have to receive in order to be willing to sell the good. The principle here is that you're not willing to sell the good unless you can cover your costs. And this is why the willingness to sell will be very much related to the marginal cost, the opportunity cost of producing the good. In fact, they're going to be the same thing, and both of them will be equal to the supply curve. So, in this example, we can have that in order to sell the tenth unit of the genes, the firm would have to receive, let's make it $40 again. So here we see that the firm is willing to sell the tenth pair of jeans for $40. Of course, a firm's willingness to sell will change if things change. In particular, if the cost of producing something changes, then the willingness to sell something also changes. For, for example, what would have to happen in order for the firm to be willing to sell more than 10 jeans for $40? Well, in that case, we must have that the cost of production would have decreased. And the cost of production can change for two reasons. One is technology could improve. Or the second one would be that the firm has access to cheaper inputs. Both of those two factors would lead to the supply curve shifting outwards. Now that we understand the demand curve and the supply curve a little bit better, we can start talking about welfare analysis. The two most important concepts in welfare analysis is consumer surplus and producer surplus. Let's uh, try to define these two concepts. The consumer surplus is going to have something to do with the demand curve, while producer surplus is going to have something to do with the supply curve. 
consumer surplus is defined as follow, follows. Is a, if a consumer is willing to pay more for a good than he or she actually has to pay due to the market price being lower, then that difference is going to be equal to consumer surplus. For example, if a consumer was willing to pay $60 for a good, but they only had to pay, say, 40 because that's the equilibrium price, then the consumer would receive $20 in consumer surplus. Of course, this is true for all goods, so if we were to add up the consumer surplus, from starting at zero goods consumed to the equilibrium quantity consumed, we will be able to trace out or calculate this entire area. If this demand curve, say, started at $100 and you will consume, say, 10 units in equilibrium, we could have calculated consumer surplus to, to be equal to the area of a triangle which is base times height divided by 2. In this case, that would be equal to 40 minus, or 100 minus 40, which is 60. That would be the height. The base will be equal to 10, and divided by 2 gives us the equation of a triangle, which is equal to 300. So here, consumer surplus is equal to 300. Now, if you think about producer surplus, Producer surplus shows that a producer will get some benefit from being able to sell the good at a price, say, again, 40, which is higher than what they would be willing to sell that good for, maybe, say, 20. And that difference here, which again would have been, in this case, 20, would be producer surplus. This is true for all the goods starting from producing zero goods up to the equilibrium quantity, which is why we could trace out the triangle underneath the price line and above the supply curve. Here, the producer surplus would have been equal to, again, base times height divided by 2. The height here, say it starts at a number 5 when quantity is zero, the willingness to pay or the marginal cost would have, or willingness to sell and the marginal cost would have been equal to 5. We can see that the difference, the height is 35, the base is once again 10 divided by 2, 350 divided by 2, which is 175. That would have been the producer surplus. So let's, uh, let's recap here. To define consumer surplus, consumer surplus is defined as uh, the difference between what a consumer is willing to pay, which is the demand curve, compared to what the uh, consumer actually has to pay, which is equal to the equilibrium price. And as a practical matter, consumer surplus will be the area above the price and below the demand curve, as we can see. Above the price, no, yeah, below the demand curve. Producer surplus is defined as the difference between what a firm is willing to sell the good for, which is the supply curve, and what they are actually able to sell the good for, which is the market price. And we can also say that that's equal to a triangle. And the triangle here now is the difference between uh, your willingness to sell and what you can actually sell the good for. So the price, the area below the price and above the supply curve. Okay, we understand demand and supply, as well as consumer surplus and producer surplus, but now we want to think about the market efficiency. In a perfect world, in a free market, then uh, consumers and producers will interact 
until you get to a point that is the price will adjust until you get to your market equilibrium where demand and supply intersect. Now this point, I'm going to argue, will maximize both the sum of your consumer surplus and your producer surplus. And this is really what we're trying to do when we're trying to do welfare analysis. We want to maximize surplus. So in this case, we want to maximize consumer surplus plus producer surplus. And we're going to argue that there is no quantity different from the Q star that would make consumer surplus and producer surplus larger as a sum. Let's think about uh, if you had less less production. If you had less production, so you have, say, underproduction, which we call QU here, you can see that uh, the marginal benefit going to consumers is greater than the marginal cost. And in a perfect world, in a free market, these two curves actually uh, tells us exactly the benefits to consumers in society and the cost to society from producing the good. And if the benefits are greater than the cost at the margin, what we have here is that we could have some trades that will make the society better off. And if we don't make those trades, we're going to lose this little triangular, triangular area right there. That is, we lose, some, we lose some consumer surplus and we lose some producer surplus and nobody gets that. And later on, we're going to call that a dead weight loss. A loss in consumer surplus and producer surplus that nobody gets. Also, if we were to, say, produce more units, so we had what we're going to call overproduction, we can see that now the marginal cost to society to producing that last good is greater than the marginal benefit to society. This cannot be good because that means we give up more as a society to produce the good than we get in value when we consume it. So what we need to do there is cut back. We need to produce less of this good. And if we don't, we're going to be losing this area. So this is not a triangle that shows a deadweight loss, a loss to society that nobody gets. So what we're going to do in the future here is once we understand the consumer surplus producer surplus framework, we can think about government policies, policies basically, that moves the economy away from the market equilibrium to either an equilibrium of underproduction, this will be, for example, when you have a tax, or to, the, to an equilibrium of overproduction, this will be an equilibrium associated with, say, a subsidy. In a free world, in a free market, I should say, and in a perfect world, these two movements will sh give us, as we can see in this diagram, deadweight loss. That is, we're going to have less efficiency, we're going to have less welfare after government policy. Of course, later on, we're going to have to make it very clear that we don't live in a perfect world, which is why a tax or a subsidy could actually be a good policy. Thank you.